Hey everybody, today I'll be talking about Sarah Perry's book, Every Cradle is a Grave, The Ethics of Birth and Suicide. And in this book, Sarah Perry um, argues that the prohibition of suicide is immoral and that suicide is should be legal and also um, that suicide is morally acceptable. In addition to that, Sarah Perry is an antinatalist, which means that she holds the position that um, it is morally unacceptable to bring children into the world. Um, and she also has a lot of discussion on sort of the phenomenon of suicide and how we deal with it in our contemporary society, which actually brings me to one of the first things that I wanted to talk about about this book, um, going chronologically, is that Perry has a really interesting discussion on what she calls uh, the sacredness concerning suicide um, and the sacredness of life. And she talks about um, how socially we have these concepts that we consider um, sort of collectively to be sacred and that any sort of deviation against these sacred topics um, is taboo and met with hostility. And it actually reminded me of a term that is used sometimes on the internet. Um, I don't know, Sarah Perry doesn't mention in the book and I don't know if she's aware of it, um, but it's called the Agent Smith Effect. Um, which is a reference to the film, uh, 1999 film, The Matrix. Um, in, the, in The Matrix, in the movie, and also the computer simulation within the movie, The Matrix, um, the agents uh, of the computer simulation can um, make themselves be anybody. So you might be sitting on a bus next to an old lady, but then if you start to question the Matrix um, and you're interfering with its integrity, um, then that will, lady will transform into uh, an agent, like Agent Smith. Um, she'll sort of like morph into a woman's face, her face will become Agent Smith, and then they'll attack you. Agent Smith would attack you in the Matrix um, in order to protect the Matrix. So the Agent Smith um, effect or phenomenon uh, is a term used on the internet to describe when someone's kind of like triggered by something um, that they don't want to discuss, and they're sort of protecting, um, similar to how Agent Smith would protect the Matrix in its integrity. Um, the Agent Smith effect is when someone is protecting the sacredness of uh, whatever their contemporary culture is. And Perry, although, like I said, she doesn't use that term, has a really interesting discussion on sacredness and what um, the internet knows as the Agent Smith effect. And how this ties into suicide is obviously, uh, suicide is a very taboo topic, uh, for many people an emotional, emotionally triggering topic. Um, and when you discuss suicide, especially um, from this position of someone like Sarah Perry, um, you will be met most, more than likely with um, hostility and emotional, emotional criticism and things of that nature. Um, and she discusses how that sort of sacredness against suicide discussions um, hinders any talk of lifting the prohibitions on suicide and also um, whether the philosophical discussions on whether or not it is immoral or moral um, or morally acceptable and um, subsequently philosophical discussions about antinatalism. And Sarah Perry argues that suicide, well first she talked, has a discussion on um, the worth of life and uh, here she talks about whether or not life is meaningful and Perry it seems uh, feels that life isn't very meaningful objectively or subjectively um, so from an objective meaning standpoint, um, secularly or uh, theistically, um, or sort of a subjective standpoint, like say an existentialist. Um, and Perry is arguing against that sort of idea that life is worth living because it's meaningful. And in order to do this, she invokes um, sort of a twist upon Robert, philosopher Robert Nozick's experience machine thought experiment. And I won't describe the details of the experiment, though it's um, very interesting and Perry briefly describes it in her book um, but essentially the idea behind the experiment is that we wouldn't want to live authentic, inauthentically um, in say like a matrix type of simulation even if it brings us uh, more meaning and or more happiness and Perry's argument is, is, is that um, the actual world is in a way um, we our society we socially enter into experience machines where we um, create illusions um, that give us meaning. 
we sort of pretend that life is meaningful, according to Perry, that life is meaningful, and we pretend that, um, that, that the things we do in our life matter, and that um, we're living our lives for meaning. We sort of trick ourselves into doing it. And similarly to how Nozick would say we shouldn't enter into the experience machine because of its inauthenticity, um, Perry also uses this as a um, jumping board to argue um, in favor of suicide, or at least that it's morally permissible, um, and also that it should be legal, um, and that the prohibition on it should be lifted, um, because we are living inauthentically um, with our illusions of meaningful lives. And then I wanted to talk about, um, let's see, oh yes, okay, so then she talks about the prohibition of suicide, and she argues about, um, she kind of tackles the main arguments about why suicide should be illegal, and also why it is uh, immoral, and then she argues against those. And one of the biggest ones is the idea that it is selfish, and that um, we're sort of by um, committing suicide, people are um, sort of stranding the people um, who, their loved ones, their friends and family and such. And Perry's argument is essentially that um, it's actually the reverse. To say that someone shouldn't be able to commit suicide uh, morally or legally because of that reason is, is actually selfish. And I want to read a brief quote. She says, um, quote, providing our company is a voluntary act, and we are under no moral obligation to do so. The company and support of a person is best viewed as a privilege, not a right. Um, so Perry's argument is essentially that to say that suicide is selfish because we're leaving behind our loved ones and family um, is to sort of imply that we have a moral duty or obligation to um, give company to our friends and family. Um, and she talks about how someone can just move away and do the same thing that a suicide would do and never see their friends and family again, and that that is perfectly fine. Whereas doing it through suicide is illegal and often considered immoral. And she talks about how suicide has sort of the more permanent um, aspect to it, whereas moving away um, is maybe there's still hopes that you'll be reunited one day. Um, but again, she says that these hopes that the friends and family might have the person, um, potential suicidal person, doesn't have any moral or legal obligation to give those people that hope. Um, and then she attacks, I think that is probably her strongest argument, but she goes against several other arguments um, for the prohibition and immorality of suicide, and I think she does a very, very good job of arguing against them, and arguing that suicide is morally permissible and also should be legal. And um, she also talks about, in great length, what causes suicide, which is one of the more interesting parts of the book, um, even though it's somewhat more social science than it is philosophy to an extent, because um, it has to do more with what is actually empirically the case and statistics and such. Um, she talks about how there's sort of this grand illusion that suicide is often caused, caused by mental illness and specifically depression. Um, but she talks about how suicide is actually very often caused by uh, three other factors, and that um, suicide doesn't really correlate very well with mental illness and specifically depression. And I wanted to read a brief quote that talks about that. Quote, depression occurs most often in women and young people. Suicide, by contrast, occurs mostly in older people and men. And then when talking about what actually causes suicide, she talks about this uh, very large study by Thomas Joyner into what causes suicide, um, which is titled, Why People, <clears throat> excuse me, Why People Die by Suicide. And she says, quote, according to Joyner, there are three main factors that influence the decision to commit suicide. The feeling of being a burden on others, a failure of social belonging, and acquired competence in one's suicide method. Um, and she talks about how the largest factor is um, the failure to belong in relationship, relationships um, with the opposite sex, family members, and society. So I thought that discussion was also interesting um, in that sort of the, the 
the popular belief about what causes suicide is empirically incorrect. So Sarah Perry's Every Cradle is a Grave um, was a very interesting book on a very taboo topic. Um, this isn't in any way an endorsement of suicide, um, but I do endorse Sarah Perry's very excellent book. Um, even if you disagree with its conclusions, and even if after reading it you disagree with the arguments, I think that philosophically it is a very great idea to uh, sort of, the um, cliche is like leave your comfort zone, and to tackle these issues that are taboo and that you might disagree with, and to really uh, consider them uh, honestly and sincerely. Um, and so for that reason I give Sarah Perry's Every Cradle is a Grave a 5 out of 5 rating. Very great book. Thank you for watching.